We are very excited to have Joseph Leconti with us. He is the director of the Simon Center for American Studies at the Heritage Foundation. Professor Leconti, welcome back to our studio. Sebastian, it's terrific to be with you. Thanks so much for having me. So we've had a discussion on your incredible book, A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War, that we did for our special subscription service. It was such an exciting discussion, and it's all the more relevant today that we're doing this live YouTube discussion. No commercial breaks, no interruptions. First things first, uh, talk to us about the book you wrote and why you wrote it, and why these two people, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, are important for us to study in 2020. Thank you for that. I think that the friendship between Tolkien and Lewis, they met at Oxford in 1926, I think it was, became great friends, and then went on to write these great epic stories, or if you think about it, war is at the center of both of their great stories, The Lord of the Rings and The Chronicles of Narnia. They're war stories in a lot of ways. I think their friendship is probably one of the most consequential friendships of the 20th century. And I think it's a deeply encouraging story. We forget, because there's no one around now to tell us what it was like to have fought in the First World War. As which, they both have. As they both did in the trenches in France, survived that, that hellish experience. And then they have to live through a Second World War. So their lives are bracketed by conflict. And think about everything that happens in between. <laughs> you know, the 1920s and 30s, the gathering storm of fascism. If I had to describe, uh, had to describe in three words what uh, is a, so appealing to me about their story uh, and why it's so important now, uh, it's war, friendship, and imagination. Because it was the crucible of war, the conflict of it, the, the, uh, the tragedy of it that helped make possible their amazing friendship. And it was their friendship that helps to make possible the creation of their great imaginative works. And, and these two men, J.R.R. Tolkien and C.S. Lewis, um, we're really facing an uphill battle because of, of the cultural forces yes. following World War I. Talk to us, Professor, yes. um, what was going on uh, after the death of World War I, after the trenches, uh, a young generation of men almost wiped out? What effect did that have politically and ideologically yes. on, on Western civilization and its belief yes. in itself? Yes, that's the right question to ask, that the phrase from Barbara Tuckman, uh, the Pulitzer Prize winner about the First World War, is the age of disillusionment. And part of the reason there's such incredible disillusionment is because there was this idea about progress leading up to the First World War, what C.S. Lewis called the myth of progress. Things are getting better uh, every day in every way. All technology is getting better. Human nature is improving. We can create the near-perfect society. The eugenics movement will take off uh, in the 1920s and 30s, in part because of this disillusionment now with the First World War and what it's done. There's no progress, it seems, now when you hit the trenches of France. Now it all looks like it's, it's, a, it's a lie. So the incredible disillusionment that then begins. Now, why does eugenics, for example, take off? It existed before the First World War. Now there's a sense that there's something wrong in the human species that can be improved. We can somehow modify, improve through genetic engineering, through sterilization techniques, for example. We can create the perfect man, the perfect woman. So that, but that grows out of the disillusionment of the First World War. And you is think it, about those contagions that are set loose. How, how much of this is a function of um, a, a, a nihilistic attitude to the transcendental? That, that we have the influence of Darwin, who looks at progress as a mechanical function. There is yes. evolution and things always get better and the yes. weak are weeded out. Then you have Margaret Sanger, this eugenicist who was actually um, ad admiringly described by Hitler. Hitler instructs the yes. Nazi party yes. to send Margaret Sanger, the proto-founder of Planned Parenthood, yes. a, a letter of admiration for her eugenics. And then we have on top of that, um, we, we have the, the Russian Revolution at the end of World War I, which is built upon the philosophy of Marx and Hegel, which is a repudiation of the transcendental. Exactly. So they take Hegel's, he Hegel's dialectic is always about a, a, a synthesis, a dialectic towards the ultimate mm. truth, which for Hegel as a believer was knowledge of God. There was mm. a transcendental mm. end point. What Marx does is he 
turns it on its head and he denies the existence of the transcendental yes. and says that the ultimate dialectic endpoint is is a paradise on earth utopia where yes. there is no private ownership of property everything belongs to one class and the only class is is the working class uh, it, it seems like a perfect storm whereby the death of six million men in the trenches and then the 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 crippled the wounded who come out of the war it, it, it is it it's it's kind of understandable yes that the, you know, they declare the death of god yes that's exactly right the shell-shocked soldier is kind of a walking metaphor for the emotional psychological mood of many europeans and the ideological pandemics that just take off after the first world war you've described some of them communism fascism, fascism. eugenics freudianism they are right. all if you think about it, deeply anti-God, anti-transcendent. I, I've just been reading about Freud. Yeah. <laughs> In a nutshell, and uh. please do your own research, friends, listeners, viewers. Um, Freud's school, which is, is su the idea that this actually became the basis for psychoanalysis or psychological uh, analysis of humans, is posited on the idea everything everything drives back to sex and to the the carnal desires the 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 the, the subconscious carnal desires that, that men and women have yes. anyway so so let, let's talk about yes these two men they're, they're islands of sanity are they not that's exactly right that's exactly in this, right in this insane world that's exactly right they're trying to create a haven of judeo-christian sanity a defense really of the western tradition and its highest ideals and the dignity of man the transcendent the dignity of man and if you think about the how and only one of them was a believer at this time well you're right in 1926 lewis is still an atheist okay it's tolkien who's the believing catholic right. who's going to help He's in lewis's help journey many right. authors and other other men will help in that journey Lewis will say, as he, as he meets Tolkien and other Christians at Oxford, a little group of them at Oxford, he says, suddenly all my friends, they've, they've, they've turned against me and where he was. And he's pulled into this uh, refreshing, beautiful community of, uh, of like-minded men and artists, thinkers, writers, which is so transformative for him. We can talk about it. So let, let me translate. So everybody, you have to read this book. It's fabulous. My wife still won't give it to me. I have to buy another one today. Yes, sir. It's A Hobbit, A Wardrobe, and A Great War. Um, it's the story of these two men who... I was cynical about this, but, but I think I'm coming around to this argument that these two men, more than anyone else in the 20th century reignited Judeo-Christian civilization's core principles through their fictional writings, through Lord of the Rings, um, through uh, the, 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 the Narnia Chronicles, and, and reintroduced us in an incredibly wholesome fashion to the archetypes upon which our civilization, which is the best civilization ever, uh, was found.